Wednesday, we uh, looked at the nonlinear case, and then uh, what we needed was the result of the empirical process, so it was actually uh, a gap in the proof. We just assumed that everything was nice, and then we can consider things as in the linear model. And what we assumed was that if you take uh, the set T, which is where the process behaves well and we and that's where this is bounded by the noise level, what we call it alpha zero times alpha one. And we assume that this set had had um, large probability and then preferably we wanted to have um, this noise level like in the linear case something like one yeah, uh, and then if, if, if we're on this set if this is true one can prove anything as in the linear case but then you first have to check of course that this set has large probability so I'll just say a few words about that uh, so let's let's consider an example. Anyway. So the example is uh, logistic regression. Uh, in logistic regression, the response variable is binary, say zero or one. Just for no answers, I just like that. And we have a covariable which is Okay, so in the logistic regression it doesn't make sense to model y as a linear function of x because the linear functions are not between 0 and 1. Huh? So that's why, that's why you use some kind of transformation to say, well, the mean of y is some transformation of a linear function of x. So let me write it, uh, the mean of y so let's say x is fixed and so given x this probability is well, some function of x u so this is not a linear function but it's a transformation of linear functions and a logistic regression it's assumed to be of the form something which is always between 0 and 1, namely this point. Yeah. I guess you know this model. And then, so this is say the true function. Linear, this is a linear function. linear function of x. Okay. Okay. okay, then the, the log likelihood is, well, I have to think, so log likelihood, so the, mm -hmm. so Expressions and I take the logarithm. And so minus, so let's say the last function, rho theta is x and y, is minus the log likelihood. If parameter value is theta. And that is, so this term is then equal to. This, the log of this term is y times the log of mu divided by 1 minus mu. And then you get y times f x. Um, and 
and then this term with minus sign because of the minus one time. So one, one minus mu is one plus x, and I guess you get a plus sign again. I'm not sure. Let me check. Because of the mu. One over, you get minus. So what is this expression? P and minus P both equal to P to zero. Well, rho theta is here, and you subtract rho theta zero. If you fix x, so conditionally on x, this is non-random. So it cancels out if you subtract the expectation. Okay, and then what you are left up, end up with, so this is p and minus p means subtracting the expectation. So if you subtract here the expectation, well, you subtract this term again and you get here y minus its expectation. So you get, and then you average, so it's 1 over n, zero is like moisture. So you can bound it by one. Well, maybe I write it in matrix notation. Okay, one more time, one more time. So epsilon transpose. Again, what you end up with is to bound the maximum, this is the maximum of p random variables. There's nothing new to, to do. You, have to be, you can do exactly the same arguments as in the linear case. Okay. So here there is no problem. Uh -huh. And it goes, goes Gaussian and variables because they're 
just between zero and one, or minus one and one. And that's the same for, um, so this is a special case of a generalized linear model. And uh, this is then the canonical link function, if you know about the linear model, generalized linear models. So as soon as you take the canonical link function, then in fixed the design, you always end up with the random part being so linear that there's no problem at all there. You don't have to do sophisticated arguments to bound them. Now, let's consider one more example then, where it's a little bit more involved. So, let's say, um, least absolute deviations regression as an example. So, let's now take show that it's found a constant time. Let's consider this first. Okay. Then I instead of subtracting the expectation, I now put in this uh, Ladermacher sequence and assuming it's independent of the Bound it twice, expectation, and so okay, okay, whatever. And then instead of that, you take to state one over n, some epsilon i times the functions of work, which are You said, oh well, this function, this is a um, function of sheets, the absolute value function. So um, instead of taking absolute values, I can just take uh, what is inside. So then we get expectation. Minus. The whole thing is t to zero. Mm -hmm. So it's p n minus p rho theta 
And then, again, you can say, okay, I use the dual norm inequality, yeah, so I get the L infinity norm times the, times the L1 norm, and the L1 norm is bounded by M, and the expectation of the L infinity norm, well, maximum of P random variables again, is bounded by, uh, I think it's, so there's a two here, two norm. Times the L1 times N. Okay, and then, well, maybe it's not normalized, so times rho hat, say, rho hat, what I call it, the diameter, so say the variance. not normalized design, you have to, okay. usually you just normalize and that's equal to one. That's a, you put all your variances equal to one. Yeah, and then, we're already sort of in this situation, but I want this set to have large probability. Now I know that what's here is in expectation, it's of the right order of magnitude. But it's then also true in probability. You can, for instance, use uh, concentration inequality of Mossar. A correction term which I can bound in this case uh, plus m hat square root, I think it's 8 times t n. So m will be bound. very powerful. Once you have the expectation, you can, or bound to the expectation, well, you see, you, you get a correction term which is not going to spoil this bound, it's even a smaller order if P is large, because there's no lot to P. Okay, so do, then you're done. So, so I gave two concentration inequality, one on the maybe only one, yeah, one one is for bounded random variables, it's more of like a, like a Bernstein inequality, which I gave last time. T 
this is more like a, a hoofding of inequality, if you, if you know about these inequalities. So, there, these are always the two main explanations of inequalities that come back and back over and over again in this kind of world. So if you look at this, you see all you're using here is actually, you can do this trick always as soon as these loss functions are leap sheets. And so leap sheets loss functions, if you think about it, it means that something like the first derivative is bounded, and it's something like the influence function is bounded, so it's robust. So in the robust case, you can always do this contraction trick, and that trick as well, there's everything goes so it's quite general. And here in D and C, we usually use subgroup sharing to the first ones? Uh, uh, D and C? Here? In D, you use, uh, well, yes, a Krauss entity. And then, well, they are automatically because they are a Wadermacher sequence. Okay. Yeah, so there's no problem there. So you really don't need, need any Krauss entity assumption anymore. As soon as you have Lipschitz loss, because of the robustness, yeah, you can have fine. any deals. Yeah. It's, it's all fine. Yeah. But there it is. It's here, here I again use the, the Lipschitz property. So, uh, yeah. So it's. So I'll just say a few words. So, Massar's inequality is around x1 to xn d, say n n functions. And it's assumed that f of x i comma by well let me put it this way by some constant here depending on constant i. And here the constants are just depending on the design. And you have this leap sheets property, so you get here exactly um, as norm, natural norm. This is like the variance term. They are measured in terms of the ci squared. It comes in here, and we can bound our loss functions to rows. And so you have a place. Yeah. And so our special application here is we call theta. And I can bound them by theta minus theta zero. Um, X uh, I theta minus theta zero. Which is deep sheet property. And there's an I everywhere. Yeah? Absolute value. So if I take the square, take the square everywhere, and so I can, and I take the sum, and this is what I call before. J of such terms, so you can bound it by theta um, minus zero one times the maximum of the norm. 
that they are over in center. Maybe I forgot about some there. So you should the expectation of f of x i is zero. There are no further assumptions. So it could be that I have got the constant here for the center. So what I'll do now is make a little introduction to the next the topic, structure of sparsity. And then I'll show the main results in the book. So what we've done, if there are no questions about this, we'll just go on. Yeah. So, we, so far we considered L1 norm. So now I'm going to um, extend that. Like that. So if you have categorical variables like the color of your 
eyes, there are three possibilities. Brown, blue, green. Huh? And to code that, you, you need two dummy variables. Yeah? Now, if you say, okay, color of your eyes is important for a certain um, outcome or not. So either, the, to, for the two dummy variables, they either have both non-zero coefficients or they have both zero coefficients. But not one is zero and the other. So you group them in one group. And same for education level, it's either important or not. So if you have five education levels, I have four variables, I put them in one group, all coefficients zero or all non zero. Okay, and then the penalty would be like this. sum over all groups. And usually what you do is also you weigh with the group size. And then the number of groups is maybe R. Special case is that you put everything in one group and then you just have the whole vector and you just take the whole L2 norm of the vector. That's only a good idea if you really um, uh, for testing, because if you, if your groups are too large, you can imagine if you have very large groups, you put everything in one group, not to zero, it means that you have to estimate all those parameters in that group, and if the groups are too large, there are too many parameters, and then you have inconsistent estimates. So if you do with everything in one group, you, it's okay if you're doing testing, but not for estimation. Yeah, so this is an idea of you have some structure and then let's use it. Maybe just for the interpretation of the estimator, but also for the reasons. Maybe because it will be mathematically better. So, so far that's not so clear, but it helps. So another example would be that you say, well, I have my model and you write it. Well, the first variable is, is probably most important, and comes the second variable is probably not so important. So I don't know, maybe in the end they will probably be all be zero, but I'm not so sure. But I have the feeling I have to somehow um, give more weight, um, more importance to the first variable. So I think there's some kind of order. But somehow you want to impose that on your model. So I think, well, this is a decreasing sequence. And at a certain point, it will be all zero. How can you model that? Well, there's one general way to do that. If you say, uh, it's a penalty. It's kind of a, I don't know if it's real, but it's, um, it's kind of a weighted sum. Um, if you want 
this kind of model, where the first coefficients are more important, you say, well, the, this is a cone, a cone. Because we don't have that much time, I just have to convince you that this is uh, a general way to describe penalties. So, for so a special case, um, another example. If you don't restrict the A's, so it's, it's a cone that is maybe a subset. There are terms, let's just minimize this thing and then we'll see what happens. So the minimum over A of beta, beta is now just one dimension. Let's just minimize it. With A positive. Okay, take the derivative. Uh, it's beta squared over A squared with minus sign plus one. Put that to zero. So that's a special case of this type of penalty, where you don't restrict the coefficients. That just means you don't have any idea, no about idea about structure. But as soon as you start restricting here the, the A, the cone, you get uh, an idea about structure. So for instance, if you take, uh, let me make another example. Some of the beta j squared is the alpha norm. And by the same argument, you get here this is 2 times alpha norm. This is 2 times the alpha norm. So taking the cone here all constant, you get the L2 norm. Taking with everything, you get the L1 norm. And by playing with that, for instance, like this, you get something in between. For instance, the group lasso is taking constant within groups. Now you can show that this is a norm. To show that this is a norm, you need some, to do some work. But, uh, uh, what, what we can also see is that 
you have to, um, as soon as you start putting <coughs> structure on, in your penalty, you have to do it in a sensible way, so that you believe that the true is indeed of that structure. And so for instance, if you say, okay, the first one are the most important, so I put this kind of penalty with this code and so on. And in, in fact, it's the other way around. The last ones are the most important. Then you can imagine that you're doing something stupid. And you will get bad results. So if you, do, you use the wrong penalty, which has a structure which does not correspond to your uh, truth, then it will not work. For instance, in the group lasso, if you group the variables in the wrong way, and that within a group there are some non-zeros and also some zeros, then it will, the, the estimator cannot help, but it will put all those non, all those zeros also to non-zeros, so it will start to estimate irrelevant things and then you'll get a lot of noise. And then you get bad results. So the structure has to be the correct one. So the problem yeah. is inconsistency? No, it's just uh, efficiency, loss. efficiency loss. And it could be in the, in the bad case uh, uh, inconsistency. So I'll give you just the result. So what I'll show on the, on the slides is a sharp or maybe it's good again to, uh, to recall what that is. So it's the idea is uh, that you have a set, a collection of models, for instance, a linear model, and you consider all submodels which are just taking a few of the variables, a subset of the variables. So for each S, you have a subset of the variables, and then with if, as soon as you have taken the subset, you can do just these squares, for instance. But you don't know which subset to take, so you want to do take the best subset. Hmm? Okay. So Fs is just uh, taking the subset, and you have a loss function, the squares, and the risk. And then I don't know which model to choose, so I want it to minimize over all possible models. But then, of course, there is a price to a remit. That's called the sharp limit. So it wants to mimic the best within the class. And it's called sharp because here there is a constant one, so it's the best, which is the best order uh, estimated. And non-sharp order inequality, which you see in literature, is that it's the same kind of expression but with a one plus delta in front. Yeah. And uh, yeah, well, it's kind of interesting that for these kind of models, which are convex, you can prove sharp order inequality. Yeah, so it's kind of natural because if this is very large, if you multiply by one plus delta, if you look at the difference, then the difference between these two can be small, but the difference between these two may be large. So you have to subtract the true risk in hoping that this will be small, so that multiplying by a constant, one plus delta, it's still small. So it's not so elegant when you want sharp. Okay, I will try to prove that. Mm. So I have a high dimensional model. And we, we take some norm on the p-dimensional space, like the L1 norm, that can be any norm. And let's say we do least squares plus penalty of the function two times uh, the tuning parameter times the, this, this norm, which, which could be the norm which is fit. And then we want to prove sharp or Okay. So now uh, the notation is as before, so we can call beta s is the z, the collection of betas putting them to zero if they're outside the set s. Um, if you take 
this norm you have the last one. And now what I need is a certain property of the norm, which I call decomposability. And it is this property of the L1 norm that if you take any subset of the variables, you can write the L1 norm of the vector as the L1 norm of the parameters inside the set S plus the L1 norm of the parameters outside the set S. So that's very special for the L1 norm. That's called decomposability. If you think about it, it's not true for the L2 norm. We have the triangle inequality, but that goes it's a, goes the wrong way, actually, I suppose. So. so actually that's only true for the L1 norm, and we need a little bit less, and that's on the next slide, I guess. So I need some kind of reversed triangle inequality. So beta s plus beta s complement is beta itself again. And so omega of beta is less than omega of beta s plus omega of beta s complement. So with less than or equal, you have the triangle inequality. To prove oracle inequalities, I need to reverse, which is of course not true. But then my escape route is that I have here the same norm, but here I may take a different norm, and then it's just, it may hold. So whether you or not you can de decompose your norm in this way depends on what set S you choose. And uh, if it can be done, we call such a set S allowed. So that just means, think about the group lasso. You can only put, uh, so set, such a set S has to be a union of groups. You cannot take parts of groups in one in S, so parts of it in S, parts not, and it will not be decomposed. Either you take the whole group or not. And then the union of those groups is our allowed sets. That's what it means. Uh, yeah. Similar here, if you think of this example where all the coefficients are decreasing, the allowed sets are only sets which take the first so many coefficients and then zeros. You're not allowed to take first coefficients, then some zeros, and then again some coefficients, that's not allowed. So it's allowed, the structure has to be allowed. And then you can decompose. Yeah. Uh, so here's the problem. But the group plus all allowed sets are unions of groups. sort of generalizes uh, L1 and L2 norms to something, everything which it also is in between. And so with this example I just said okay first so many go from zero and then everything zero is allowed. In general if you have some cone here you have some drop is an allowed set is, is a set such that as soon as you put coefficients outside into zero, that you can still stay within the code. Yeah. Okay. That's the allowed set. Now the notation is as before. Then we need um, those compatibility constants or restricted eigenvalues. It's exactly as as for the lasso, except that now we have here this new norm. So it used to be here L1 norm equal to 1, and L1 norm less than equal to L. But now we have a different norm, but otherwise it's the same object. And I don't put the square root S here now, and I call it something different, because well, it's just history. So it's the distance between two um, uh, combinations of column vectors, one inside the set S and the other outside the set S. It's just the distance, the minimal distance between the two. And if the distance is small, it means that they're very correlated in some sense. 
and then you have difficulties getting good results. So one over this distance is something like the sparsity. If this is small, you're happy. Uh, let me draw a picture. So in, in, in high dimensions, they all live in n-dimensional space, so as soon as n is bigger than p, you, you will have that they are all in the same space, and if you then project this on that one, nothing happens. The distance is equal to zero. Just for the picture, think of it as, as not being in that space, so you can project on that space. And if this distance is large, you're happy. You're not very close. And what plays a role so is this, that's like the, the length of the anti-projection, this part, this way, which is on top. But because we're in high dimensions, we cannot do that, so we have these restrictions. And these restrictions, this restriction says I'm only allowed to look at uh, this set within, well, maybe like this. So, project on that set I'm not I'm not completely free in my projection. I have to look at the smallest distance to linear combinations in some set. That's this set. And that saves me because in higher dimension that distance would still be positive. Otherwise it will be just zero. Now if you look in the in the, the L1 case this is just the L1 norm and this is some kind of uh, um, yeah. complex sets like this. But for other norms, I don't know what it looks like. It may be has a different shape. And I, I don't also don't know if, if this quantity is going to be smaller or larger than so if the L1 case. If there's no comparison, that's, that's not so clear. So this quantity is not so well understood. You can use the same tricks as with the random matrix theory that you can bound it by eigenfunks of population with covariant matrices. But so far, it, in, in the literature, if you look at literature, there's no clear answer yet whether you win anything by using a different norm that these constants are better behaved. This is not clear. So. But, but we can bound it from zero by using the same norm. Yeah. The, the argument goes exactly. It doesn't show that you win something over L1 norms. So you put in stru uh, structure in your norm. You think, well, I have more a priori knowledge. I use more structure. And then I should get efficient, more efficient estimators. This is so far not so But at least it doesn't hurt. It seems not to hurt. <laughs> these coefficients are numbers. So yes. It's possible to convert. If you, have, if, you have, if you have your x matrix, in principle, you, everything is known. You can just look at the numbers. It doesn't give any insight. You can just maybe do some put on your computer and see how it comes out. Then you have a different, come somebody come by with a different x matrix, and you have to start all over again. You don't have much insight. No. Okay. No. There comes the concept of dual norm. Now compare with L1. Logic comes. So, so far we use this inequality. It's the dual norm inequality. And that was nice for the L1 norm. If you have a different norm, you just have a different dual norm. Not the infinity norm, but maybe something, something smaller. 
can just define it. So I call it omega star. And there's also an omega star for the complement because we have to use two norms now because of the decomposability. So and then you can prove this sharp or for inequality. So the noise level I now denote by lambda s. It's the dual norm again of the absolute transpose x. And it can be, well, you can split it inside and outside the set s. We define L, so lambda is to be larger than the noise level inside the set. Uh, sorry, outside the active set. Um, oh yeah, it's important to assume that S is an allowed set so that it's decomposable, that it has this right structure that we do. And then, um, well, beta is a factor which has its uh, non-zero coefficients inside the allowed set. And think of the beta is a factor which has, um, in the group loss of instance, uh, it has this group structure, and maybe it has some zero inside the group, then, then you're not so happy, but it's in principle allowed. It's the set S is a union of groups, and I'm going to uh, assume that beta only has non-zero coefficients inside the set S. Maybe some zeros, but outside S it has everything. Okay, L is like before. And that does not the zero to one. And then we have the orbital inequality, so the prediction error is bounded by the prediction error if I take it in beta with a constant one, so it's sharp, and um, a remainder term, which is exactly like before. So here we have something like square root log p over f, log p over n. In general, it will not be large or maybe small. And this is the sparsity, which before was just, um, before we had here S, the size of the set, divided by this constant. Well, this is just a different notation. Yeah, we call it effect of sparsity. Yeah. So, related to by Bach, and there are many papers by Bobuszynski and Bach and computer science people. They have uh, similar results, but not, not the sharp, sharp ones with the constant one. To prove this, I wanted to give it as an exercise, but then I, you need a little ingredient. You need a uh, generalization of what was before for corollary 1.4, which is very simple. I, I can, I can give it in the next uh, talk if you want. You can think about it, vote about it, or we just skip it. But maybe you want to give it. If you want uh, to have some exercises, it's maybe useful to give the necessary tools for proving this. It's really simple. Anyway, the conclusion is that all the results go through, and you can also use non-linear loss, everything goes through for general norms. The only key ingredient is, is that you have to assume decomposability, which is natural, it just means you're putting structure on your norm, but it has to be the right structure. That, oh, maybe not that I forgot to say. So what's beta here? It's arbitrary. So you can minimize this over beta. It's for any beta, so you can take the best one, so that's the sharp or more result. Yeah, now let me just quickly give the next slide and then we have a break. You can put in a little bit, if you can take this constant a little bit larger, you can also get rates of convergence for the estimation error, so for the, the norm of beta hat, you get rates of convergence for that too. These norms will be small. And because omega in general will be a stronger norm, it means you'll have better results in terms of estimation error than with the standard lasso. Think of the uh, L2 norm. L if, if you have a result for the L1 norm, you say, well, 
I'm not so happy. I wanted for the L2 norm. It's a stronger norm. Is that true? And if you do that, if you do it so, in general, overcast is a stronger norm, so getting rates for that is better. So, in that sense, you do win a little by showing the structure because the norms are strong. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just make a little uh, introduction on the blackboard before going to the slides. Um, so what I'll do is uh, use a different penalty. For uh, the linear model, let's consider that for a moment. So let me write uh, S of beta is going to be uh, the size set, well, it's just the number of non-zero coefficients. So what you could do, and which is also very sensible, is to minimize with this penalty that you say I take b down f. And so this square say Now the reason why you cannot do this in practice is because if, if they're correlated you really have to go through all 2 to the power of p subsets. And that's just exponential and if p is already 40,000, 2 to the power of 40,000, you cannot do that. So you cannot do it exactly. Now I'm going to graphical models and I'm going to nevertheless use this penalty. And I'll try to explain why. It means that in practice uh, what you do is, is, is some kind of greedy algorithms, greedy search. Now, I'm not a specialist in algorithms, uh, so don't ask me too many details. <laughs> but I'm going to develop some theory for an estimator you cannot compute. But in practice, you can often really see or check whether or not you obtained the minimum, even though you cannot guarantee that you can compute it. Sometimes you can be lucky and just say, okay, I can check whether, I want to, whether my algorithm converged to the minimum. So it's not completely hard. Okay. Now let's go to graphical models just. So consider, um, again, a data matrix, n times p. And suppose they, the well, let's say the rows are IID and normally distributed. IID normal zero sigma and capital zero here. Okay. And assume that sigma has an inverse and call that C. Okay. And you can draw a picture, you can just you know this is theta, you can draw a picture and you put an angle, sorry, an edge between two nodes. Then these are the two nodes, it's one. You put an edge if there's a non-zero in this matrix. So you can write sigma for theta and j, theta j k is the, is the partial correlation partial correlation between x i x j x k given all the others yeah. that's something you have to check that's just a property of the Gaussian distribution. Okay, now what we'll do is actually consider, so this, you, you get some kind of graph. You just calculate this inverse and then you can try to draw a graph. Like this. X1, 
expressing the dependencies between the random factors. And you know that in the regression model, what is beta here? Beta is non-zero if and only if there is a partial correlation between y and x of this xj given all the others. So there's Think of an example. Um, X3 is uh, lung cancer, X2 is yellow fingers, X1 is smoking. The idea is smoking causes yellow fingers and lung cancer. And it's not true that yellow fingers causes smoking, causes lung cancer, or lung cancer causes yellow fingers. Huh? There, there's this cause for things. And yet you want as a statistician to find the causal relationships, not just relationships, to cause relations. But that's a really difficult problem. It's often not identified. But it's really different from this. You just don't draw these edges, you draw also errors. But the way to model that is that you say, for instance here, and let's see, you have some uh, errors, let's say, um, X2 is caused by X2. X2 is say beta 1, 2 times x1 plus error. X3 is beta uh, 1, 3 times x1 plus error. And x1 is just a parent of everything, so that's just a So that's a way to model it. This is called the structural equations model. And you can write this model down very simply if you know where the errors are. So the arrows, so if you know the structure, and you can write down the model. And then you can start estimating coefficients, it's just some regression type of model. Now we assume this model and we assume sparsity. So you think of many variables, and many betas, but most of them are zero. So no. is this a definition of that one causes the other or what is the definition? The definition, so this is a model now. Mm -hmm. The definition is more general. The definition, if you write down the graph, and the definition is um, x j is a function of its parents and noise. So the, the real definition is in literature you see many, 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 is that you can look in terms of the likelihood. The likelihood, you can partition it in terms of the I won't go into all the details. Yeah, it's a different course. Yeah. Okay. Now, think of many variables and just write these equations. They are called the structural equations. Write it as the vector x is a linear model plus a okay. And of course, you cannot have that 
X itself, there's no circle, so on the diagonal of this matrix B, there are zeros. It cannot occur on, on the left and the right hand side. Mm -hmm. So there are no circles, means that you also you cannot have that X1 causes X3 and X3 causes X1, or maybe via D2. So it may be no circles. That's a very general theory, and this is a special case, and this is called the structural equations model. Okay. Now I want to estimate B, but I don't know the structure. All I know that it's uh, that there may be no circles. You really think this B, I'm assuming going to assume sparsity on this B, there are not too many edges directed edges, and it's really assuming sparsity in some kind of parametrization. It's different from assuming sparsity in this matrix. So the, if this matrix is sparse, it may, may not mean that that B is sparse. The other way around, probably yes, I forgot some connection. Okay, so what I'll do is just write down the likelihood. That's very easy, everything is Gaussian. And then uh, maximize the likelihood, and then use a penalty, which is just the number of non-zero edges. Yeah. And then, of course, numerically you are in trouble, but you are in trouble anyway, because um, what happens is that we just have to think about think about p equal to two, just two random variables, x1 and x2. And all you observe is just observations of those two. Then there's no way that you can decide that x1 de uh, determines x2 or the other way around. It can be both. You just don't see it in your likelihood, so it's just not identifying. When you think about it, you just look at it and you can write it in this way or this way. What I'm doing here is just saying, okay, what well, I'm x1 and x2 here. I can project x2 on x1 and then have an arrow here. Epsilon 2. And I also can draw the same picture, x1, x2, x1, and project x1 on mm -hmm. x2. And then have an epsilon arrow here. Now you have, there's no distinction. So for it means in general that you can always order your variables, choose a certain permutation of your variables, and then given that permutation, you state the first one, say, as the parent of all, then the second one you project on the first one, then the third one you project on the first two, and so on. So for every permutation of your variables, you can write down the structural equation models of this form, giving the same likelihood, giving the same covariance matrix. It's just projections, it's just gram smith I don't know if you know the gram smith You can do it in any order in your life. So the idea is that you want to use, do it in such a way that in the end, the matrix B, which is here, is sparse. So you use the gram schmidt ordering such that this is as sparse as possible. So that's an additional difficulty, numerically, and uh, because, for instance, already in this with two variables, you cannot distinguish between the two, and they're also equally sparse, eh? just one edge. So you can just cannot decide between the two, so it means you have a whole equivalence class of possible solutions, and in the numerics you go through all those equivalence classes which you cannot distinguish anyway, and which have the same number of edges. And it all boils down to that actually this penalty, just counting how many edges there are, is the natural penalty and not the L1 penalty. Because that sort of mixes up the equivalence classes. It also mixes up the whole algorithm when you get L1 doesn't help you at all numerically. Yeah. 
So if L1 doesn't help you, well, we throw it away, we do L0, this is both L0 and L3. And then just hope that my greedy algorithm converges. Okay. Now let's see, what can you prove then? Yeah. Any yeah. question? So the problem is not about that we don't know the errors, it's not about causality, which way we go. The problem is just we cannot very really identify which, which, what is the sequence yeah. in these vectors. So it's not about the right? So far. Well, you know, this is a whole discussion. If you go into the causality literature, people really want to find out causality relations. And then you can try to find a way out. So there's if you use more assumptions, then you can identify them. That's actually the idea. And uh, I don't know if you know this, there's this whole business of faithfulness. And it's, it's really a different way of thinking. But as a statistician, you just say, I have my likelihood, my data, whatever, and that's it. And you cannot, uh, given the data, you try to find out a graph which corresponds to the data. If you look in the literature, what people do is they start with a graph and then they start to find out which data uh, can correspond to that graph. And it's a little bit mixing up <laughs> so the order of argumentation. Once again, why this motivates us not to consider that it is not necessary to stick to the too long, we can do this now. Yeah. Why um, the possibility of doing this? Errors, we like to relax in this. Yes. Yes. Um, because um, if you use uh, just counting the number of edges, these two remain, they remain equally good. Mm -hmm. And I think that's fair, because you have to be fair, you just cannot distinguish them. Yeah. And if you would use L1 here, you would start distinguishing between those two mm -hmm. for maybe not so natural reasons, just because of the, the weights of the edges. So in that sense it's not, this yeah. Yeah. So you need good arguments to say, well, that's what I want. And for the moment, I don't see those arguments. Okay. Again, you can use the same arguments as for uh, L1. You just say, okay, y minus x theta x squared plus log plus squared plus theta x can be bounded by y minus x theta 0. And here's the true number of non zero. Rewrite that, I get x beta hat minus beta zero less than plus this can be bounded by two edge length transpose x beta hat minus beta zero. that in terms of the penalty. And then the whole machinery starts working. And so you just say, okay, if beta hat would have dimension s, well, what does this behave like? Something like square root of dimension divided by 7 cents. And 
So maybe if you want to play with that, we can prove the following lemma. Um, inside some S and I fixed S, fixed S, S, and then look at the random part. Um, and then probably that it's larger than the square root 2 size of S. That's the concentration. And so this is like a concentration inequality for fixed S. And what you have to do, what the penalty does is sort of kill this random part, so it has to be for S of S. So we take your lambda here of order same, eh? square root log p. The log p becomes from having um, exponentially many ah, because of because of you don't know the size, of the, you don't know where the zeros are, and you have to have um, yeah. P over S sets of size S and this can be bounded by P to the power S. So if you take the logarithm, that's where the log P comes from. Okay, so a very rough sketch that the penalty is such that you kill the random part. Now what's kind of difficult with the graphical model is that you don't know the ordering of the variables. You have p factorial ways to order the variables, and that's why you cannot do the standard uh, arguments anymore. But still, you get similar results if you do the, the concentration inequalities. In the, in the, yeah, in the right way. So let me try to show you what I did. So we have a Gaussian design, a Gaussian design matrix X. Because there's no response variable, we just want to look at the X matrix. We say X is a directed acyclic graph. In the Gaussian case, that just means you have this linear model. Like P0 is the edges. And the P times P matrix on the diagonal of zeros. You cannot be a parent of yourself, that's what it says. And epsilon is a noise factor, but we assume them to be I and I, independent of each other, and independent of the, the parents of a, of a certain child. And uh, so a noise factor, oops. So we assume the noise is uh, I ID with on the diagonal. So that's very simple to see. 
see. If you have this model, so you write x equals x b plus r. So you can sort of solve that equation. So you get x equals um, I think I'm doing it correctly this way. So the covariance matrix, that's expectation of x transpose x divided by m. And then you get expectation of the errors. The um, set of edges, so that's the, the number of non zero betas. No? And now you can write a covariance matrix in that form. So, what is the form? The form is B0 is a matrix which is lower diagonal after a certain permutation. It has to be lower diagonal or upper diagonal if, if you make sure you have the right permutation. And omega zero is a diagonal matrix. So you can do all these orderings, and for each ordering you do the gram smith order polarization, and you get a, a, the, the same sigma zero again. And so there are several ways to represent sigma zero as a directed acyclic graph. Now, let's take one of those representations with the minimum number of edges. Okay? That will be my true lab. The one with the minimal number of edges. And if there are several, just pick any of them. So take, take the sparsest, re sparsest representation in terms of the Oh. Then we have our empirical covariance matrix. That's all we have. We can write down the likelihood. So assume everything is all centered, that you don't have to calculate the mean first, so just subtract the mean, and then you only have this covariance, and you write down the likelihood. That's this. Likelihood for Gaussian matrices. And then we maximize the likelihood. Maybe that's minus the likelihood. Yeah. And we minimize the minus the likelihood. Subject to the solution has to be blank. And such that the number of edges is small, so we penalize the number of edges. Let's see. And there it is. So minimize minus the log likelihood plus Laplace squared times the number of edges of that solution. And the likelihood it has to be of this form. So now you have it here, I take theta is the inverse. It's the inverse of this thing, so it's minus b um, omega inverse my minus b and somewhere there's a transpose so it's transpose probably here so it has to be of the right form it has to be that ok that's the estimator so there's b hat the estimated edges and the estimated variances of the error term and that's the number of edges of this estimated. Um, so it means it's still not identifiable, but if they're if they represent the same likelihood and have the same number of edges, then I just identify. So here's the notation. This is the notation I used throughout the course. Quadratic forms. This is the empirical one. This is the theoretical one. For each permutation, we can write the true theta zero as the 
as a deck. Yeah. So then we have for each permutation true edges and a true um, matrix of variances of the error term. And I don't denote it by deep tilde with a zero denoting that it's, it's the true. It's still the truth. It's an unknown parameter. Maybe not the one with the minimum number of edges. So let's see. Um, so the number of edges at node j is denoted by sj. I don't know if I need that. The total number of edges is denoted by s. So that's the number of edges if you use that particular representation of the true precision matrix. Here's an example. Uh, so if you have an autoregressive model, for instance, then you just have a chain x1 determined by x2, x2 by x3, and so on. And you can reverse the trend to chain, and it still has the same number of edges. And then I say, okay, by either representation, I'm fine with that. Okay. So in the example, in the motivating example you gave in the beginning, it means that you can draw different arrows, just the same number of arrows. You mean them the smoking and lung cancer? Yes. Yeah. But so very different situations can be in the same way. Yeah. Yes, so I'm fine if you say, okay, I want to remove that edge, but there's one here. Then there's still the same number of edges and if that's possible, but that's probably not possible in given the for, for a given covariance matrix. You cannot just remove one edge and put it somewhere else. What you can do is represent it in this way, that you say there's an, an additional error, error. But then it's not the one with the minimum number of edges. So you say, okay, I don't like this one because I can represent it with less edges. How can we have two different features, two different graphs? Uh, you can remove this and you can do this. It completely depends now on the signal. What you can do here. So where was the problem? what we think is the true model. You can add here another coefficient. So x1 is to say the parent of everybody, x2 is the parent of x3, the number of x1. And so this may be still allowed to be met on x2, and it's still okay. And it's still okay. In this way, that's always possible that you can represent any covariance matrix in this way. Only very special covariance matrices allow you to remove this. So it depends really on the covariance matrix where you can remove this or not. And maybe you can keep it and remove something else. So that's not so clear. But it really depends. It's, it's really complicated. It's a very, if you think about it, it's, it's algebra, polynomial equations, whether they have solutions. It's really difficult to find out. <laughs> it's, yeah, solving the determinants of, uh, uh, yeah. No, it's really difficult. I, I, it's kind of nice to have a glimpse at that, even for the non-directed case. So you have your covariance matrix, and there are some zeros there, maybe meaning that variables are uncorrelated, huh? so they're independent. Now you take the inverse, and those variables which used to be independent here are maybe no longer in, uh, do have an edge here. Or the, is that true, or is it the other way around? It's complicated. Yes. If you take a sub-matrix, and so you have a big matrix, let's consider only this matrix. 
some regions. And let's invert that. What does this have? It has all the partial correlations given the other variables inside here. And where are the zeros now? They can disappear, or they can come back in. I mean, these are actually algebraic difficult problems. <laughs> so, yeah, it's really difficult. Uh, this, this, that's why there are so many books on graphical models. <laughs> yeah. we can define the solution. So when we do the estimation, we have a random permutation in head. And we can define for that random permutation the solution for the true, true underlying uh, precision matrix. And do the gram schmidt orbital canalization for the truth, but with the random permutation. Okay, and let me just go through. There are very many random uh, permutations, so that's a, a problem. So doing, we can do all the concentration inequalities, but you really have to think of time and spend some time thinking about how to do this. this is kind of now let me give you just some conditions here. So this is my covariance matrix. I assume some kind of uh, normalization with the say um, covariances are bounded by one, say, in a non-zero eigenvalue because otherwise you cannot convert to that. Um, I'm also going to assume that the number of edges at a particular node is smaller than n to sample size. It's kind of, you need to assume something. If you assume that at a certain node there are n edges, you can just fit, overfit, and you have variance, and your variance is to zero, and then you run into problems. So you have to assume that the number of edges cannot be too large to avoid overfitting. The penalty does not help you here. Because the penalty will not, if you, you can use very many edges still, and then the variance will be zero, and then the minus log writing will be minus infinity. And you can penalize that as, you, as much as you want, it will remain minus infinity. So this <laughs> So you really have to assume something about the number of edges at the node. And then, uh, that's that. Um, assuming the same for uh, each permutation, that no matter how do you, you do the permutation, the number of edges at a particular node is not too large. And then, and then I'm assuming that no matter how you do the permutation, the non-zero coefficients are not too small, at least not all of them are very small. I'm assuming here that not all of the coefficients are below the noise level. Because you're, if you're trying to estimate the graph and everything is below the noise level, it's difficult. Okay, there, these conditions are really kind of difficult, but still works. If you assume all these conditions, then you get Tuning parameter, the usual order, no problem. A rate of convergence, I'm writing in terms of order for the, this is the sum of squares of all the coefficients, and the sum of squares of all the noise variances. They are all estimated with the right rate. No, just the number of non-zeros divided by sample size and the log term. Okay? That's as good as you can get. And also the number of um, non-zeros that you found is about of the same order. This is the number of zeros. Um, yeah. I'll explain. This is actually the, not the true deck, but the one with the estimated permutation. But it has about the right number of edges. So since you cannot identify the true deck anyway, all you want is about the right number of edges, and you get that. And you get convergence to uh, a solution which has about the right number of edges. OK. 
ok. Um, now, kind of nice, what you can do also is just to make the whole thing identifiable and then everything goes down to standard results. If you assume that the variances all are equal, or maybe you, they're not equal, but that you know them up to a, a constant, so they may, uh, may be different, but um, you, you know them up to a scaling factor. Okay, say, say they're all constants, say all one. And then you do maximum likelihood, but now under this restriction, and then everything is identified, and then all the problems disappear. It's kind of nice. And then you can really identify the causal relationship. You should the variances are all one. And think of this example. You have two variables. It's one, it's two. Does it go this way or this way? Well, if you reverse the error, in one direction the variance will be large and the other direction. So if you if you make assumptions about the, the, the variances be able to identify the direction. So you have to think about that it's not trivial, but it works. Alright, then you can prove similar things. So if you assume the variance is all, all one, then if you take the wrong permutation, you have to assume that with the wrong permutations the variance are not all one. I have to be able to identify the permutation with that. And that's what I'm assuming here. And then this and the number oh yeah I'm assuming that this dimensionality is probably is not that large. And then then you can it's kind of nice the so this estimated the estimated permutation will then be the true permutation with large probability. So you sort of identified the ordering, and once you did that, everything is trivial. You get also, uh, with maximum likelihood, you get this same rate again uh, for the least squares estimation error. It's the same. But maybe you don't want to use it at all. Just say, okay, I identified the ordering now, and then I do a second step given, given this ordering regression, estimation, with lasso or whatever. Okay, so you can think of this as a first step. All right. Uh, yeah, I think this is then all for the course. Thank you very much. I very much enjoyed your presence and your patience also this last lecture. I hope it was useful. If you have questions, you can of course always contact me via email or if you want me to send more material, let me know. Thanks a lot.